honestly, you're going to be so uncomfortable in your first house hack. Um, right. You're, like when you're, you're going to be like, you're making the, probably the largest investment you've ever made, probably tens of thousands of dollars. You don't really know if it's going to work for you. You're going to have all these what ifs, right? What if the roof caves in? What if you can't find tenants? What if the pipes burst, right? You have all these what ifs, but I challenge people to maybe think of the opposite of that and think about like the what if nots, right? Like what if you don't house hack, right? Now you're going to be stuck working for 40 years. Welcome to the House Hacking Success Podcast, where you'll learn the path to free rent and financial freedom through real estate. Featuring your hosts, Brad Labrie and Drew Klingler. Hey everyone, real quick before we start the show, Brad wrote an amazing ebook that will teach you everything you need to know about house hacking and living rent free. To get a free copy, text house hack all one word to 22828. That's house hack all one word to 22828 to get your free copy. Welcome to House Hacking Success. We have an incredible guest today who is an author of Bigger Pockets book, The House Hacking Strategy. Craig, we appreciate you coming on today. Hey guys, yeah, thanks for having me on. All right, so a lot of people know you from Bigger Pockets, but let's step back before that when you were in venture capital and and finance world. Tell us about what led you into real estate and kind of your background in finance. Yeah, so I graduated from Northeastern University in 2015 with this desire to go out to California and start my own company and be like the big startup guy, like the next Mark Zuckerberg. And basically, um, I moved out there right after school. I worked there for like six months and then realized I really started to not liking it. And then after about like a year, I really, really started to not like it. And what really broke the straw out my camel's back was this weekend I had in Big Sur with my girlfriend, right? So for those of you who don't know, Big Sur is this like beautiful part of California. We had this like private little beach where the waves were crashing against the island, the, the, the land. It was just like so peaceful. It was a great, great getaway and I had no cell reception, right? I get back Sunday night to an email from my boss saying I had to get this memo out by 5 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, 8 a.m. Eastern time. And I was like, well, there goes the last night with my, you know, my girlfriend because yeah. like, she's moving away. I'm moving away. And what the heck? So, um, yeah. So, so, you know, she was upset. I was upset. And I was just like, man, like, there's no way I can live my life like this. Like, how, how do I get out? So I started to think of dumb startup idea after dumb startup idea. And eventually I was just like, man, why do I have to come up with a startup idea? Why do I have to reinvent the wheel? Why don't I just do thing that like 90% of all millionaires do and just invest in real estate. And so I, you know, I started going down that path of real estate. I got into bigger pockets. I started listening to every podcast, watching the webinars, reading, reading the blogs, reading the forums. It was just like literally four or five hours a day, every day, just like getting obsessed with real estate and what it would do. And over the course of that six months, you know, I ended up seeing a job at bigger pockets open up and I was like, Oh shoot. And they need a financial analyst. That's like exactly what I can do. So I applied for the job and you know, because of my passion for bigger pockets, you know, they went ahead and hired me for that position. And you know, now here I am today. So what's the one thing that would separate uh, potential house hackers from people that are actually going out, getting the property and house hacking? Honestly, you're going to be so uncomfortable in your first house hack. Um, Right. You're, like when you're you're going to be like you're making the probably the largest investment you've ever made, probably tens of thousands of dollars. You don't really know if it's going to work for you. You're going to have all these what ifs. Right. What if the roof caves in? What if you can't find tenants? What if the pipes burst? Right. You have all these what ifs. But I challenge people to maybe think of the opposite of that and think about like the what if nots. Right. Like what if you mm-hmm. don't house hack? Right. Now you're going to be stuck working for 40 years or you're never going to actually real estate invest because you're too scared. So like embrace that uncomfortability and realize that that turning in your stomach, that like really nervous feeling you get is just growth, right? That's what growth is. And very soon after you do that first one, you'll be very comfortable and you'll be slinging offers left and right. So just that's part of the process, that uncomfortability. So just embrace it and be ready for it and then be ready to continue to move on. That's That's great advice because there's, there's a huge opportunity cost there. And also, like, one of my favorite things to point out about house hacking is you have to pay rent somewhere anyways, right? Yep. So why not do it in a house hack? You're probably going to find renters. You maybe might have some vacancy, but for the most part, you're going to be saving money overall. There's a lot of people doing it. 
That's right. Totally. Yeah. One thing I actually want to add to is um, that that's just been like weighing on me because it, this might just be a frustrating point for me right now. But, you know, again, I, I represent a lot of people in Denver and a lot of them are just a lot of people that I've experienced all my clients are really looking for this like home run of a deal when you house hack. You don't need a home run deal when you house hack. You need to get into a house hack, right? You could say you could nickel and dime and save ten, fifteen thousand dollars off the purchase price, but ultimately that's going to be like maybe thirty bucks, forty bucks off of your cash flow, which is going to mean nothing because you're probably renting a place, at least in my market, for like at a minimum eight hundred bucks, at a maximum maybe even two thousand dollars. It's more important that you're going to save those eight hundred to two thousand dollars a month as quickly as possible than it is saving fifty dollars a month on trying to get a deal for fifteen grand less, right? And you know, you don't get that built-in equity right away if you get that 15 grand less, but you're going to be waiting a lot longer to find a deal. It's probably going to take you an extra six months to save that 10 or 15 grand, and it has based on my client experience. And the, the one of the most powerful parts about house hacking is that you do it every year on the year, right? And so if you're waiting six months to try to find the best deal all the time, right, then you've got, you've got a problem, right? Because, you know, you're only going to be able to do five house hacks in 10 years instead of 10 house hacks in 10 years. And yeah. this works for any time period. If you don't want to house hack for 10 years, just shorten it for five. But yeah. I'm, I'm running out the numbers now and there's going to be a blog post coming out about this. The difference there is also like a million dollars over the course of 10 years. If you house hack every year on the year, but don't get a great deal, just get an okay deal that works. Or if you do every 18 months, get a house hack, but you get the best deal you possibly can, 10, 15 grand off the purchase price. So Again, it's best to just get in, get started, and get moving than it is to like find this home run of a deal. Yeah, I, I remember uh, what my mentor told me a long time ago. It's kind of in the same vein of what Brandon Turn talks a lot, but he just told me like one okay deal is worth a thousand books. He's like, you'll you'll learn w more from one okay deal than you would if you just read for you know a year straight uh, on the subject because you're actually involved with it, you're emotionally involved with it, you remember things. From an emotional standpoint, and I remember Brandon Turner talks about this often, uh, the fact that, you know, you're not you're not going to become a millionaire from your first deal, you know, and especially with house hacking it's so unique that like if you can literally just live for free or come close, right, like that there alone is going to change your life more than, you know, maybe. I mean, it is important, you know, don't get me wrong. Like it is important to, you know, get a good, you know, structurally sound property, uh, you know, get, get a pretty good location. But like you said, finding a home run deal isn't really the goal. No, make sure. Yeah. Right. Like make sure, make sure the house is built correctly. Right. Make sure it is functioning. All right. Make sure it does work. But I'm just saying like you get a great house that's going to really work as a house hack. Like, don't worry about trying to nickel and dime, like the, the purchase price is an arbitrary number that the seller has decided on, right? Yeah. Like if it works for you at their asking price, just give it to them at their asking price, right? Like why, mm -hmm. like why play this dumb game that people like to play where like I need to steal from you to make me more happy or to make it worth my while? Like, right, the, the, the anchor is like a listing price, but the listing price is an arbitrary number. So honestly, I usually ask, I usually offer in like actually higher than, than what I, what I uh, what the listing price is because I just want to get the deal and get in and put in the strongest possible offer and just move on, you know. So, something so. that I've been helping pers people personally with, and we've talked about this before, uh, is uh, you know asking at as or going in at asking price or above and bringing kicking back seller concessions for some of my more uh, you know I don't know about sophisticated clients, but people that are house hacking but they want to keep reserves you know, on a property, I was like, here, listen, if the numbers make sense, and we always make sure the numbers make sense, you know, that, that is important. But if the numbers make sense at asking price, like why, you know, go in, get some seller concessions, keep some money back for reserves, right? Put some money into the property if you want. Um, but yeah, the asking price isn't necessarily, you know, or, or the number you buy the property for is so arbitrary. You know, it's the numbers. It's the, the you know, future of the deal. It's, you know, what it, what can you do? Can you, you know, are you breaking even? Are you, you know, paying your mortgage every month, right? And so we've been able to do some unique situations with seller concessions and things like that. Um, yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah. Honestly, I love that you said that. And I love that method. And if you guys out there are not in like the Detroit or Denver markets and you don't know, and your agent may not think of that strategy of offering a little higher, but getting seller concessions, it means the same exact thing to the seller, but helps you out a little bit more. Right. And so if you can do that, then absolutely do that if you if the numbers still work for you at that higher purchase price. Um, 
Yeah. And I remember, I remember like my mm -hmm. first flip, uh, you know, this is a long time ago before I knew any of this, this stuff, but uh, a seller um, came in and they gave me like eight grand over asking price uh, if I brought back five grand. And like from the seller standpoint, before I knew like, you know, what really, that was my first time I really even knew that seller concessions existed. Uh, and like, I was like, like, I was like, well, of course I would go, like, I'm making three grand. Like, I don't care. Like, of course, you know, and, and uh, like, it was, it wasn't even a, you know, I accepted it like within a second. Uh, and so th that's, a, my point is that that's a seller's perspective. Like, if you give yeah. them a little, little bonus, what we did uh, with just the most recent one, I'm just closing the, uh, on Monday, uh, is like, we, we gave them an extra thousand dollars, you know, to get money back. Right. So we gave them, it was a win-win. It was like, you know, I told him, I was yeah. like, listen, you want these, you want this uh, money here, give them a little, you know, give them an extra thousand, they're going to accept it and let's move on. And so that's what happened. Yeah. And, and $3,000 of monthly payments over the course of, of 30 years, that's, that's your yeah. increase in the mortgage in that case. Yeah. You're talking like $3. It's like a yeah. stupid amount, right? Exactly. Like it doesn't even, it's not exactly. the needle for you at all. So yeah, exactly. I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about that first deal. Uh, and you know what that meant and what sort of how you financed it and how you found it for sure. Yeah. So, you know, I moved to Denver in, um, when was it? April, 2017. Um, I, you know, when I first moved there, you know, I had like a list of things I knew I needed to do, right? Like I knew I needed to buy a car cause Denver's not as, um, like public transportation friendly as like California is. I needed to, uh, to find a place to rent for a couple of months, month to month lease. I needed to like get used to my new job, kind of get hang there. Um, and I also knew I wanted to drive for Uber. So and I did that as like a little side hustle for a couple of months. So I could a make some money, B get to know Denver, C just like tell everyone what I was doing to hopefully maybe start building a team. Um, and so like all those things. And then by June, 2017, I had closed on my first duplex, uh, just a, uh, like five blocks north of Denver's largest park and about a mile and a half away from the office. So it was like a perfect location and a really up and coming area. I purchased that for 385,000. I rented out the top for 1750 and I rented out the, and I, I lived in the bottom and now that wasn't quite covering my mortgage. So my mortgage on that one was about 2000 and, um, yeah, so, so, so yeah, I was about 250 short each month, and that's not what I wanted. I wanted to cover my mortgage. So what I did was I basically started renting out my bedroom on Airbnb, and I slept, you know, I made a quasi-bedroom out of my living room by putting up, like, a cardboard room divider and a curtain with a futon behind it. And I slept on that futon for a year while other people, while I had a revolving door of guests coming out of my, my bedroom. It, that's an amazing story. It's probably my favorite house hacking story, uh, <laughs> you living behind a curtain. Um, yeah. And so, you know, you were able to cover your mortgage, which is, I mean, incredible. Uh, what did that allow you to do for that next little period of time? Yeah, so I was just saving like crazy, right? I was in like, I was in per, like optimization mode, right? I was like not eating out. I was riding my bike to work. I had my car rented on Turo after I was done Ubering. Um, you know, I was, I was making friends. I was studying for my real estate exam. Like everything I was doing was just towards this ultimate goal of financial independence for that whole year, basically. And, um, and yeah, so that allowed me to save again, you know, save another 20 or 30 grand over the course of that year so I can then do it again. Right. And the second time, you know, I bought a five bed, two bathroom house just north of Denver, about five miles, five, 10 miles north of Denver. And this time I actually got my own bedroom I don't know, and then I rented out the other rooms so that they like, you know, the, the rent from the, <clears throat> now the rooms would cover the mortgage. Could you tell us about that and how you finance that second house hack? Yeah. So this time, this so the first one I did a three and a half percent down FHA. I can't. I don't think I mentioned that previously. The second one, I didn't have enough equity in that first property because I didn't do anything to it mm -hmm. to refinance and get my FHA back. So what I did was on my second one, I did a five percent down conventional loan. So it's a little bit more down, but still only five percent and. Um, yeah, so I did five percent down. It ended up being about seventeen grand in uh, down payment plus closing costs, and then I put another thirteen grand or so into it just to like make that make that fifth bedroom pretty nice. And uh, yeah, so I was renting out all those for all the rooms, not including living for free. So thirty one hundred, not living for free. And, or sorry, thirty one hundred and living for free, with another with a mortgage that was about two thousand dollars. So you're looking at 
you know, making well over a thousand dollars over the mortgage and living for free. So not a bad cash flowing deal. You were renting by the room on that deal. Yeah, I was running, renting it by the room. Exactly. How were the leases written up? Like, oh. how did you handle the leases running by room? Okay. Yeah. So basically each room, you can kind of think of it as its own separate unit. Um, that's kind of how I thought of it. And basically the lease is 90% the same of any, uh, as any other lease. The only thing that's really different is you might have some additional house rules. And you also just might have, you know, you know, instead of having like just the address of the property, you'll have the address and the room type. So it'll be, you know, I just say like top left bedroom at X address. And that's kind of like the, really the only differences, but most of it is the same. Awesome. Okay. So, so stepping back real quick, a lot of people don't really know that you can actually keep your FHA as an investment property. Like you talked about, that is, that is uh well, you did speak to that like on your first property and going into conventional. Which uh, is a little yeah. bit different than some, how some other people do it. Yeah, so with all those loans I'm talking about, they're all owner-occupied lo loans. So you have to live there for one year. Um, and so if you live there, and, and once that year is up, you can do whatever you want, right? So the bank isn't going to make you live there after you've fulfilled the obligation of living there for one year. So you just keep the loan. You don't do anything. You literally do nothing. You just move out. And the loan stays as long as you keep making your payments. The bank is not going to be too mad at you. Awesome. Yeah. No, that's super cool. And a lot of people don't really realize that. Uh, so your third house act was unique because you actually basically turned it into a duplex. Uh, from my understanding, took it from a single family, turned it into a duplex. Talk about that, how you saw it when you walked into property, you know, the vision it took to see that and uh, what that deal was like, how you found it, how you funded it. Yeah. So this one was interesting, right? So this was a six bed, three bath house. Uh, and that is like awesome. Like that's probably my favorite. Like those are the kind of diamond in the rough type houses, because you know you can you can, like I was gonna just rent it by the room, and you know I was gonna make way more. I thought, but then as I was searching the property, I noticed that the downstairs had its own kitchen, had its own laundry, had its own bathroom, and had two bed, three total bedrooms, right? But one was really small, and so I was like, well, I'm not gonna get too much for that small bedroom. But what if I turn this into an Airbnb, right? I'm right. I'm basically right at like the intersection of all of the highways in Denver. So I'm, if you know anything about Denver, I'm right between where 20, where I-25 and 36 meet. Mm -hmm. And you've got 25, 36, 76, and 70. Those are all the highways all coming together right there in three minutes from my house. So you can hop on anywhere and just get there real quick. So I figured, oh, this would probably actually be a pretty good Airbnb. So the basement was super dungeony. And I was like, well, there's a lot of value add to be had here. So I basically rehabbed the whole basement, um, rehab, put in a whole new kitchen, all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, now it's all rented out on Airbnb. So Awesome. And how did you fund that? Uh, same way the second one, man. 5% down, conventional loans. Just, you know, I try to go the cheapest way possible at first. Cool. So doing the math here, you just essentially, it was a three-year period. Uh, you stayed a year at each property uh, and just kept moving out to another one. That's right. Yeah. And that's how quickly it adds up, you know, and it, like, you you know, 3.5% down the first one, 5% down the second one, 5% down the third one. You don't have to do what most investors have to do to buy a property like that, which is 20 to 25% plus reserves, you know, plus everything else that goes into it. Uh, you you have the ability to get in there at 5%. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's the power of house hacking, right? Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. That's, and, that's where all of it comes from. And the greatest ROI is you don't have you, any living expenses. You know, most investors have to cash flow from day one, right? And that is a, a you know goal of ours as well. But living in there, your your whole focus was living for free. You know, right. eliminating that expense and adding value by renovating the units. That's right. Awesome. Amazing. So your book is really good. Uh, we love your book. Uh, it's called The House Hacking Strategy. Could you tell us what you're hoping people pick up from that book? So a few things, right? The one thing is, I mean, I would love for everyone just to be inspired and get motivated to actually start house hacking, right? The first, the first part of the book is kind of just shows you how powerful it can be and what, how it can change your life. And then the second part is really everything I know about house hacking. Like it's all everything I know, right? you know, from, from, uh, from finding the deal to phoning the deal to marketing for leads to writing up you know, having like roommate interaction within the house, all of that stuff is in there. And so I just really wanted to, um, yeah, just, just make it, make it basically like, I want you to be able to read that book and then feel comfortable going ahead and doing your next house hack and maybe just looking back to refer to it, but it basically to be your only resource you need for house hacking. Awesome, awesome man.
I, yeah, I mean, anyone out there who hasn't read the book absolutely has to read it. It's an amazing book. Uh, and it, you really do just spell out, you know, and, and make people feel comfortable doing it. Because, I mean, everyone we bring on the show and, and people we talk to that is house hacked, you know, it's just absolutely life changing, uh, as you know. And, uh, and, you know, more and more people are feeling comfortable doing this um, because how life changing it can be. Yeah, so for sure. I mean, I think everyone, everyone in the world should house hack. And personally, I don't even think you should own a home unless you house hack. Yeah. Like if you want to live alone, why not just rent? Like that, that's kind of how I view it, you know? And it's really, really amazing. Uh, the Millennial Investor Podcast, I believe, ha had a statistic that said 90% of their guests um, started out in house hacking. You know, they just took a survey. And it's amazing, even the people that I know uh, as investors who are older, or whatever, they may not call it house hacking, but when you dig deep into the story, because I, I love stories, like that's what you find. You know, like many, many of the pe local investors, you know, that aren't big time, you know, they're just in my area, you know, local investors, I'll just start talking to about the story and they'll bring up the fact that they basically house hack. Yeah. I mean, honestly, almost, I don't, I don't I actually don't think I know a real estate investor who didn't start house hacking. Yeah. Like I'm thinking, I'm thinking right now, you, you know, some of the big guys, like at Bigger Pockets, right? Brandon Turner started house hacking. David Green started house hacking. Um, Scott Trench started house hacking. Like all those guys started house hacking. I'm pretty sure Jay, uh, actually, I think Jay Scott might be the only one that went right into flipping, but he was a bit older when he started real estate investing. He was probably already, he already had a lot of money to, to, to you know, to put into real estate. But, you know, just, I would say 90%, at least 90% of real estate investors start. Yeah. You know, what's cool is they're seasoned investors and some of them are still house hacking. That's right. Yeah, they still, I mean, they still are. Like David Green, yeah. Scott Trench, and Brandon Turner are all house hacking as we speak. So, right, yeah. just a little bit more of a luxurious way. But still, even, um, uh, I'm not sure if your audience knows Ben Leibovich, but he's a big syndicator out in uh, Phoenix. He's house hacking too. But, you know, he's just doing like the Airbnb thing, you know, the luxurious house hack that I mentioned in the book, where he just has his casita out back and Airbnb and that. He's not fully covering his mortgage, but he's making a thousand bucks a month. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. We know several people similar to that. Uh, m one of my favorite articles you've written, probably probably my favorite article ever written, uh, was by you, which was on the subject of PMI. You know, a lot of objections that people have, um, it, you know, to maybe getting FHA or, or similar low down loans is the PMI payment. And like we talked about a minute ago, like, they don't really realize, in my opinion, how much investors have to put have up front to be able to buy a property. Right. We talked about, you know, the 20 to 25 percent, um, you know, the bank requires reserves. Right. Speak to PMI and why it really isn't maybe the boogeyman. Yeah. So P PMI is a wonderful thing. Right. PMI allows you to use like a tenth of the money you would otherwise or maybe. Yeah to actually purchase a property, right? Like without PMI, you wouldn't be able to get property with three and a half percent down, 5% down and all of those other things. And people always want to save up that 20% down. And I think maybe share that article in the show notes or whatever. But you know, in that article, I show all of the math about why that, that idea is just absolutely ridiculous and absurd. The reason is, is that if you're going to, in my market, a house will say it's about $400,000, right? And, and this will change with every market, right? So you need You'll need eighty thousand dollars if you want twenty percent down, or you do three or five percent down, and now all you need is twenty thousand dollars. That's a fourth of what you need, and you can save up twenty thousand dollars every year when you're when you're house hacking. So now every year you're doing a house hack, and if you do that for five or ten years, you're going to have ten properties. Now, if you got to save up eighty grand every time, at the end of ten years you might have two or maybe right. three, right? right. Hell, maybe even you have five, right? Say you start saving a lot, you have five. You're still only half is where you would be if you just did the three and a half percent down. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Your tenants are paying the PMI. Just run the numbers and make sure they work. That, uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. The and I, I so in that in that post, um, I, I think I can't remember now. I'm getting my posts mixed up, but I think like the the difference in net worth over the course of like a ten year period is like millions of dollars. So you 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 decide, right? Yeah, and it's not like even in an FHA situation, PMI doesn't have to be a uh, forever thing, right? I mean, if if somebody's like so concerned with PMI, like you, there's ways to um, remove that, right? Uh, as far as refinancing FHA and conventional, where you can actually get a drop off at 22%. But uh, like, 
it's not the boogeyman. It's actually, like you said, a good thing, you know, especially yeah. for house hackers, right? Oh. Because I mean, that that PMI payment is so minimal compared to what you would have to bring, like you said, as an investor or a regular, uh, you know, 20% borrower um, that, yeah, I mean, over the course of 10 years, I mean, it'll just blow away as far as net worth and what your return of what you're paying in PMI. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. And, and remember, like, that's what makes house hacking so powerful is that you're going to get those 100% returns because that your denominator, the amount of money you invested is so low. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, your return on investment and your cash on cash returns are just, you know, ridiculous compared to some of the other investments. Uh, yeah. So on that vein, talk a little bit about the best loan products that you recommend to house hackers to look into. We've talked about a couple, but. Yeah, so the best ones are going to be um, if you're looking for a single family home, I recommend just a 5% down conventional or if you're a first time home buyer, 3% down. Do not waste your FHA loan on a, on a single family. Um, if you wanted to go a two, three or four family then you can use your FHA loan because um, typically the banks won't lend 5% down on a multifamily property, like even two or more units. If you're in the military, the VA loan is probably the best one because you 0% down, right? That's even better than, than the other options. And yeah, and, and then there's, you know, there's the USDA loan as well. So if you're in a rural area, then the USDA, and yes, that is the same organization that like grades your beef they offer loans as well that it will be zero uh, percent down, but you know you have to be kind of out in the boondocks. So, yeah, and and even with the USDA, like they actually some of the maps aren't even out in the in the boondocks. Chad Duvall uh, house hacked right outside of Austin with the USDA loan, right? Uh, in my markets of Detroit and Flint, like it's only the hub of you know downtown Detroit, downtown Flint that you can't use USDA, you can do all, all, you know, so it can be in the suburbs of a big city uh, with USDA loans sometimes. It just depends on the map. And you can yeah, go I'll online and you can find the map very easily. Perfect, maybe, maybe, I think you should put that in your notes too, just because. Yeah, absolutely, that, absolutely. Yeah, yeah we'll edit. it. They have, they have a whole mark, they have a whole uh, map on it. I was actually just on it, I'm helping somebody get a USDA loan right now. So I was looking at, uh, you know, the areas. And so I went to some of the bigger cities, but like you said, the VA loan, David Peer was on here. Uh, you know, and he's, he's in the military and they now have a renovation loan, just like the 203k loan, the VA does, um, that they're really promoting in the last two years. And that's become popular. So there's so many options out there for house hackers. Oh, there's so many, like everyone wants you to do it, right? Like all the banks want you to do it. All the government wants you to do it. There's so many advantages. So just take yeah. advantage of it. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So, uh, when you're looking at a house hack, could you tell us how you evaluate that deal? So like what exactly what numbers are you looking at and how are you figuring out what rent could be? For sure. Yeah. So I know my market pretty well. Uh, right. I'm an agent in the Denver market as well. So I'm, I've kind of, I'm in this a lot. Um, so I know it's pretty easy to see like what, you know, what your monthly, I know pretty much what your monthly payment is going to be at any point in, in any property in Denver. Um, and so, so you don't, you have that baseline, right? That's the first thing you want to look, you want to try to find out is your monthly payment. Now, if you don't know it off the top of your head, you can either go to a mortgage calculator or the best way is just to go contact a lender and ask to get pre-approved and he'll show you, him or her will show you what your monthly payment will actually be at, at any given property price. And so you have a baseline, right? Now you want to go ahead and look, figure out what strategy you want to do. Right? The strategy that works the best in Denver is the rent by the room strategy, single family home rent by the room. And the more bedrooms and bathrooms you have, the more money you're going to get. So basically what you look for is the most beds and baths for the lowest purchase price. And that's how you're going to make the most money. Now, if you're not interested in making the most money and you want a slightly living, slightly better living situation, then maybe you find a four bedroom house or a three bedroom house, right? It'll work. It'll work for a three, four, five or six bedroom house. Um, three, you'll be just under, like you'll probably be paying like just off, like you'll, you'll be paying a little bit towards your mortgage with four bedrooms. You'll pay, you'll be living for free and probably about breaking even five, you'll be cash flowing and like living for free as well. So that's really what I look for. Also kitchens and bathrooms are what take the best pictures. So you want to make sure the kitchens and bathrooms are updated and look good and people want to, people want to move there. Um, and yeah, also I like, I like to look for like locations. Um, I like to be either near a highway. I like to be near bike paths. I like to be near parks, like things that are inviting for people um, close to be. 
Yeah, it's cool. You're, you know, our perspective as agents now seeing that, like you said, uh, kitchens and baths really do sell. And a lot of times, you know, just by doing a basic remodel, like a resurface of cabinets or, or, uh, you know, whatever staging, um, you can really promote your units for not a ton of money, you know, just by updating the kitchen and the bathroom. That's right. Yeah. So uh, let's let's transition from, you know, the good side of our investing career to maybe one of the, uh, you know, in your situation, that Jacksonville house that became a little bit of a nightmare. Uh, you did a burr out there, which for people who don't know, it's buy, renovate, rent, refinance and repeat. Uh, and that was a strategy you went in there with. Talk to that Jacksonville situation and kind of what you've learned from it. Yeah, so that this whole thing has been a complete disaster and it still really is. So everything that could have gone wrong with this property has gone wrong. I bought it in August of 2018. Got my team, you know, thought that they were, but I didn't really vet them that well. I just thought that, hey, uh, David Green knows this agent, so she's probably pretty good. And same thing. And then I, and I just went with her contractor that she recommended because, hey, they're probably pretty good. He does stuff with David Green, so he's probably pretty good. And that's just actually a, a really foolish way to go about it. And you need to do your own diligence no matter what no matter what recommendations you get. You still need to do your diligence and meet them in person. So I met um, – so, 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 yeah, so I bought the property, um, got the bid. I bought it for $38,000 um, cash, got a bid for $40,000 to renovate it, and um, was hoping to list it for like one hundred and twenty. dollars Thought it was going to be like a bread and butter deal. The house was an absolute disaster. Uh, the contractor, so first off, the roof was $20,000 more than expected. The electrical had to be redone because there was copper stolen from it. The, uh, there was termite damage. The project manager walked away from me. The contractor stole money from me because he wasn't doing the work that he said he would and was just asking for draws, and I was stupid enough to give him one extra. Um, and he just like, wasn't, was not performing whatsoever. Um, the did I say there was termites? No, you did not. Okay, well there were termites. Um, there was uh, the AC unit got stolen, the cabinets got stolen after things were put in, and all that kind of stuff. Like you name it, and something went wrong with this property, right? I, I, like I don't, I couldn't think of something that didn't go wrong with it. And so you know, you definitely learn what I learned and what I am, why I'm now sitting here in Fayetteville, North Carolina, because I'm doing a similar strategy out here is that you gotta go out and you gotta meet your team, right? So the whole thing with, with investing in long distance does not mean that you never go to that area. It means that you need to go to that area, find your team, meet them face to face, monitor them for the first few deals, and then hopefully as they gain your trust, you can pull back. And so that's really the biggest thing I gained from that experience. Um, and here I am in Fayetteville, I've met a bunch of people over the last two days, and I'm really, really confident in the team that we have here. So I'm excited. Before we transfer into uh, your North Carolina deals, speak to somebody maybe locally who's house hacking and they have to deal with contractors. Like what are some of the things, because we do hear a lot uh, of investors that have difficulty with contractors, right? And you did in Jacksonville and long distance. Like what do you, what do you look for uh, maybe in someone where it's more local in your market? Like what are you looking for with a contractor? Yeah. So basically what I'm looking for in a contractor is one, a bunch of recommendations. I want to see their work. I want to see properties that they've done before. Um, honestly, look on Google and try to find some good Google and Yelp reviews. That actually is a decent way to go about it if you want like an easy way. Um, but what I want is just people who are straight up to the point, tell me exactly what they want. How can I be the best partner for them? How can they be the best partner for me? Um, and you just have like, I, I also go a lot off like just how I feel when I meet them. And I know it's not the best probably way to go about it, but um, yeah, just if, can they establish good rapport? Do they have good communication? Are their customers happy? Um, and in the one I met today, uh, yesterday, actually, like he so he pretty much works with this entire. There's like a team of people that I'm just kind of jumping in here, mm -hmm. and they've got like a rock star property manager, rock star. Um, this guy's a rock star a rehab guy. Agents, all, all the whole the whole core four that David Green talks about in his book, long distance real estate investing, and um, and yeah, and you just. Every, everyone loves the guy. So, and does he have like? Does he, do they have a lot of business? Have they been in business for a while? Are they licensed and insured? Like, make sure you have all that information. Um, yeah. So, uh, sorry if I'm being like a little sporadic, but 
there's just there's just so many um, but david green even talks about it a little bit like he says all the time rock stars hang with rock stars yeah you know? so oh. you were able to find one person and they plugged you in to all these other rock stars with your team that's right i that's exactly right i met one rock star and he knew a bunch of other rock stars and that is exactly you know that's exactly what happened and in and i've met this one rock star by going to a conference right and so for those of you who are always hesitant to maybe pay that 300, 500, maybe even a thousand dollars to attend a conference, I can guarantee you 99% of the time it's going to change your life one way or the other, uh, in terms of like investment decisions. And it is oh, so worth that extra money because someone that can pay a thousand dollars to go to go to a conference is obviously doing okay. So you should be meeting those people. So yeah. I, I will help going to conferences as well. Yeah. And, and for people, you know, new house hackers in Denver, I mean, they, if they reach out to you, who you're obviously a rock star, you know, like now you have, you know, an agent that is, you know, is already doing what they want to do. Right. And you're going to be able to plug them into people in your market. And no matter where you are in the country, if you can find somebody uh, that is doing what you actually want to do, who's somebody you trust and has a little bit of character, like they can plug you into other rock stars. So it's a great, oh. you know, great point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a great thing. Honestly, Usually when it comes to real estate investing, usually the agent and your lender are the first two people you talk to. So one of them are likely going to be the lead singer of that rock star band, if you will. Right. Yeah. So they're going to be the one you kind of want to know first. They're going to be the one that's going to then go ahead and introduce you to all the other band members. Right. The, the, the best guitarist, the best drummer and all of that. And the best guitarist and drummer are going to be your property manager and your uh, your contractor. And those are a little bit harder to find. Yeah. Cool. So like you said, you're out in North Carolina making deals on properties. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what you like about that market and why you're choosing to look around in there? Yeah. So so in in my venture capital days, they always said, everyone always said they would love, they would rather have a B idea with an A team rather than, the, rather than a B team with an A idea, right? And I'm going to use that analogy in real estate investing right now. In North Carolina, right, Fayetteville is a great rental market, right? But the market doesn't matter as much as you think, right? I've got a great team here, like an A-plus team, and that's who I'm investing with, right? Like I'm investing with my agent, I'm investing with this property manager, investing with that contractor, and I'm investing with the lenders that they have. And that is why I picked Fayetteville, right? I'm seeing what they're doing. They're collecting properties like... I don't know. People collect stamps. Like every every time I talk to them, they've got ten more units, and they're cash flowing like crazy. They're just like crushing it. Everyone in Fayetteville knows if they're an investor, they should go to this team, and so it's like a no-brainer. So I'm going. So that's why I'm here. And uh, you know, I'm sure there's a million other markets just like this one in probably every other state, but this is the one I picked because I know people here. So yeah, that's a bit. Yeah, great point. You know, I mean. Uh, kind of similar to what we had talked about before this about rock stars knowing rock stars, but you know, uh, having a you know a team is way more important than having a area uh, if you don't know anyone, you know. Uh, so or if you don't have a great team set up. So great point, great point. Um, now in that market, you're you're put a couple offers in yesterday, uh, to my understanding. Talk to a little bit about how you evaluate now deals now uh, that maybe is a little bit different than others in the fact that you actually keep. Ten thousand dollars in reserves per property, uh, and that becomes your your backup for maintenance, for um, capital expenditures, for vacancies. You don't necessarily need to factor in all those because you just keep a reserve on each property. Talk a little bit to that. That's right. Yeah. So I have a reserve for each property, right? I like to keep about ten grand per property, and that and I right. And so with that ten grand, that's my capex and my maintenance and all that kind of stuff. Now. I try not to ever dip into it, even when I do need like the maintenance, because maintenance is usually pretty small, so I can just like front that with my own money, whatever. Um, but on the big things or emergency situations, I, I like to have that ten grand. And when that ten grand goes down, you just replenish it, right? And it doesn't have to, like I may not replenish it like exactly from my cash flow, right? So if I have two hundred and fifty dollars in cash flow out here, I'm not gonna. I mean, I'm saving it all anyway, right? But you know, I may not have to wait. I don't have to wait three years to replenish 10 grand, right? I'll just make more money in some other way, put 10 grand there. And now the next more money I can make, I can just use it for my next investment. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. 
Cool. So uh, can you tell us about the five tools you use as a real estate investor? So Cozy is amazing. It's my favorite. It's my favorite tool. That is a is basically a tenant. Um, so it does a lot of things, actually. So the first thing I use it for is, is for tenant applications, right? If someone wants to apply for one of my rentals, I send them a Cozy application. They fill it out as best as they can. And they write, they, there's a background check, credit check within that application that they pay for. So they pay for that background and credit check. Uh, if that all passes, then we'll go ahead and move forward with the rental. Now, they also have this rent collection service. So you basically enter the terms of the lease into Cozy. They enter in their bank information and it just gets auto pay every month into your bank account. You don't have to worry about anything. So set it and forget it. It's great. Cozy is my favorite. Um, two is Zero. Zero is just my accounting software that I use. So, you know, at the end of the day, this owning rental property is a business. You need to track your, you need to track your income. You need to track your expenses for your tax at the end of the year. Uh, I just use Zero because that's actually what Bigger Pockets uses um, for their accounting software. And I was comfortable with it. And that's why I chose it. You know, QuickBooks or whatever might, might be better for you. Um, so uh, Price Labs is what I use. So Airbnb, so I do have some Airbnbs as, as you guys know. And Price Labs, Airbnb has their automatic pricing, right? But Airbnb is in this game to hopefully have your calendar 100% booked all the time. And I agree with that. It should be 100% booked. But they're more aggressive on the price, or like, like lower on the price. Because they don't care really about your profit. They care about their profit. And they make yeah. way more money when someone books your place than when for – if they make more money if someone books your place, place for 20 bucks, than if someone didn't book your place at all, even if it's like for a higher price, for 30 bucks. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, they, so they always reduce it. So that's why Price Labs just takes the supply and demand of the market that you're in, takes the amount of Airbnbs there. They have run some algorithm and give you like the best possible price, and it works pretty well. Um, smart B&B. There's a lot of interaction with the, the Airbnb, right? You have to like send send welcome messages, send reminder messages to leave, send you know confirmation messages, and all and ask answer questions, all that. Smart Airbnb handles about ninety percent of all that. They even have canned questions, so if you get frequently asked questions, you can just put them into Smart Airbnb, and they'll about seventy five percent of the time detect it, and then just reply with your automatic automated message. Um, the last one was Facebook Marketplace. Yeah, Facebook Marketplace. I'm sure you all know what Facebook Marketplace is at this point. Uh, it's just a place where I, I've had the most success there with my rent by the room listings. Now, some people might have more success with Craigslist. or It really depends on your area. But in, in my market in Denver, Facebook Marketplace seems to work really well. For Drew and I, we list our units on you know several places. But I mean, 99% of both of ours, uh, you know, quality leads come from Facebook Marketplace. Yeah, so, it, it's yeah, really it's nice. Great, to be able, great resource. It's really nice. Yeah, it's a great resource. It's really nice to be able to like stalk them a little bit on Facebook before too. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, moving forward, you're in North Carolina. You've house hacked three times before this. What are your long term goals uh, in real estate and maybe in general? Yeah. So, so this, this is interesting, right? So I'm actually my long term. I don't really have long term goals. Um, the reason for that is life changes so quickly that you can't possibly plan from five or 10 years out from now and actually have some, some like a reasonable expectation of actually being where you think you're going to be. So I plan about a year out and my really, my main goal is just to be as flexible as possible so that when life changes and when curveballs get thrown at me, I can just, you know, lean back and swing and hit it out of the park. Right. And I think w what gives you the most flexibility is passive income. And so I'm really just loading up in building as much pass building up as pa much passive income as possible over the next year or so. Uh, I do want to take some time off to travel in 2021. And so with that, I don't really care much about growing my net worth as I do about growing my passive cash flow, right? So that's why I've actually did a pretty hard I came out here thinking I was going to burr houses, but I very quickly realized that that's just the sexy term that everyone's talking about right now, but I don't think it actually aligns with what I'm trying to do, right? Because when you burr, at least in this market, you can successfully, right? But you're gonna refi you're gonna be refinancing at a much higher price, right? And you're gonna lose a lot of cash flow because you're gonna be refinancing that much. And my goal right now is cash flow. So yeah. what I did was I just decided to buy turnkey houses, screw the rehab, um, don't need to go through all that trouble, um, and then 
have had that two hundred dollars per my 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 baseline is two hundred dollars per per house, and you know maybe buy ten houses this year and end up with two thousand dollars in passive income, and that's way more than adding than having an extra hundred thousand dollars of 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 net worth. And that's right. that's such a great point because you know we're so easily there's a there's a a good book that I really like is uh, Seller Be Sold by Grant Cardone. Um, and just because of what like just the premise of the book, the fact that you're either going to sell your own life story or you're going to get sold by others. Right. The great marketers of America, the great salesmen of America. Right. And the fact, you know, it, it, it speaks to how uh, dialed in you are to your goals and to what you want. Uh, to not be swayed by the sexy terms, right? The the big numbers that people see with burrs, right? And things like that. You're so dialed into the fact that I want to travel in 2021. I'm not looking for net worth or equity gain. I want cash flow, right? And, you know, that's something similar in my life. And I know Drew as well, right? We have goals of, of leaving our jobs, you know, in, in a relatively short period of time. And so our goal is not net worth. It's not equity, uh, necessarily, although, you know, some of that factors in as well. I'm sure it does a little bit for you, but our goal, our true goal is to replace our income and exceed that income, you know, from That's our right. salaries. Uh, That's and so right. it speaks to your goal, you know, goal setting and, and sticking to that. Yeah. You have to, yeah, really like put the blinders on, right? Like, like take what everyone says and like, think about it, right? Like I'm giving a bunch of advice right now. Like think about what I'm saying, take it into consideration, but really weigh it against your goals, right? I think Burr is probably the best or at least the second best top two house hacking and burr i think are the two best strategies in real estate investing and uh, personally right like when i come back from my trip i'm going to start burring because then my goal is going to be i'm not going to care as much about cash flow i'm going to have tons of it i'm going to want to go for that that higher net worth number um and that's kind of what you have to realize what your goal is right do you want net worth or do you want cash flow and they are fairly correlated right like you buying a rental property for cash flow is still going to increase your net worth a whole bunch, just yeah. not at the same rate as doing a burr. Yeah. Right. So. And if yeah, and, and, cool. and if you can figure out a way to to combine the two, burr and house hacking, right? Which is what I did. Um, which is you talked about earlier the fact that you know the challenge of refinancing an FHA if you don't do uh you know you know if you don't remodel the place and build equity into it. Um, and so, you know, that's why, at least for me, I'm a huge proponent of the 203k loan. I was able to do both. Uh, you know, I refinanced because I had 30 something percent equity when I only put 3.5% down initially. Um, you know, and so if you can find a way to merge what you and I agree on would be the top two, uh, strategies in real estate, burr and house hacking. I mean, that you can do both at the same time if that aligns with your goals. For sure. Yeah. I mean, doing both at the same time is great, right? Like for me, I, I, my first one, I did nothing, right? Second one, I did a little bit of rehab. Third one, I did a whole lot of rehab, right? So as, as you get more and more comfortable with real estate investing, as you get more and more money, you can then do bigger rehabs and actually add more to your net worth, especially if you're not comfortable doing that work yourself. Um, yeah, yeah it, I kind of ironically, the house that I did no work to has appreciated by far the most just because I got lucky with the location. So yeah. Uh, right. yeah. Cool. So we love to read books, uh, listen to books. We know you wrote a book. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what your favorite business or mindset book is? Yeah, I always kind of waffle on this one. Um, not because there's they get worse. It's just because there's so many good ones out there. I really the book that did it for me that got me into thinking about this whole like lifestyle of passive income was Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week. That was the book that really got the gears turning. And then obviously rich dad, poor dad is what like, boom, solidified it for me. It was about, I just need, it was like such an easy way to just comprehend everything. Um, yeah. So those two, you know, I really love the one thing is a really good book just to like keep your blinders on and yeah. And, and also 10 X by Grant Cardone's great. I don't know. There's so many good books out there, but, um, just read them all. You should always be reading, always be learning. I agree. So in that vein, uh, what about real estate books? Real estate book. Um, Beside my book, obviously. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I'm just, I'm gonna go with Brandon Turner's Rental Property Investing book. Uh, again, that was in. I put a lot of. I, I put a lot of weight on like what is a book that changed my life and made me actually take action. And some of it might be timing, right? The timing was right when I read that book. But that book on rental property investing was actually what got me pretty comfortable and ready to make the move into real estate investing. 
I can't remember if it, it was one of Brandon Turner's books. Uh, but I was flipping before I became a house hacker. And I remember, like, I was reading one of those books because me and uh, a couple buddies at work, we read. And we read one of those books. And it was the first time I'd ever heard of house hacking. Like, the co- the concept, like, it, it was just beyond me. And uh, so that, that book certainly is is one of mine as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a great book. And it's just, it's so damn simple. Yeah. <laughs> like, real estate investing is not hard. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's hard, but it's not like the math is not hard. You know, it's right. very easy. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Very straightforward. Yeah. So we really appreciate you coming on. Greg, you're a huge inspiration to us and a lot of our audience. Your book is awesome. Uh, tell us where we can find out more about you uh, and, uh, you know, where, where people can find the book as well. Yeah. So you can find out the book at biggerpockets.com slash house hack. Uh, and, and if you want to buy it on Bigger Pockets, you're going to be able to get a bunch of bonus content, which includes like the calculator, a one on one interview with me and Brandon. I also wrote two additional ebooks on top of the house hacking book, how to save up for your next house hack, and about my crazy story about how um, I let basically let meth heads into my house. Um, and, <laughs> that sounds uh, fun. Yeah, so so that's all in the bigger pockets, like bonus content. So you can't get that on Amazon. If you just want to read the book, um, it'll be cheaper on Amazon. So just get it on Amazon, honestly. Um, but if you want all that bonus content, you'll need to go to biggerpockets.com slash house hack to get that. And if you want to just like follow my story, you want to reach out to me, I'm pretty good at responding on Instagram. Um, and that's really the best place to reach me is on Instagram. I'm at the Fi guy on Instagram. So, And we'll link to all that uh, in the show notes. Perfect. But, uh, but, but Craig, we really appreciate you coming on. Good luck out in North Carolina. I know you made a, an offer yesterday and you're going to make another one today, I believe. Um, good luck with that. You'll have to keep us updated. And uh, we really appreciate you coming on. For sure, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me, having me guys. Really appreciate you having me on here. Thanks, Greg. All right. We'll see you.